Good afternoon. I'm Jan Timmitzel, Chairman of the Nebraska Ethanol Board. Thank you all for attending and thank you all to all of our sponsors today. We are honored today to have Governor Pete Ricketts here. He is a huge supporter of Nebraska's biofuel industry. He is a true champion of Nebraska ethanol producers and Nebraska agriculture. And we are very thankful for the work that he does to keep us top of mind. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the Q&A tab near the chat. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Governor's Pete Ricketts. Great, hey, thank you very much, Jan. Hey, and Jan, I noticed you're wearing your yellow tie. I presume that's for the tie with corn and ethanol, because that's why I'm wearing my yellow tie today. Uh, I don't know what Roger's problem is, because he's not wearing a yellow tie. I don't know what he is. Like you say, Governor, that. the golden triangle. <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, well, hey, thank you all very much for letting me join you virtually for your Emerging Issues Forum with regard to the ethanol industry here. And it's a, a pleasure to be here and to be able to continue to keep moving forward on all the issues that we have to uh, work on with regard to promoting ethanol. Now, I'm gonna start this off by reminding everybody one of the three things we always gotta talk about when we're talking about ethanol with anybody outside our circle here. We gotta our friends, our families, our coworkers, that whenever you're talking about ethanol, is you're gonna save money at the pump, you're gonna help clean up the air, and it's good for our farmers and ranchers. Those are our three key bullet points we gotta remember, those three quick and easy things to tell people about ethanol every time we have that conversation with somebody. So please don't forget to mention those every time that we talk because that is how we start getting our message out. Through that, through we can all be advocates every conversation we have. And as you think back across the last, say, 15 months or so, as we came into 2020, things were looking pretty darn good for us, right? The 10th Circuit Court had agreed with us that the EPA was improperly granting those small refinery exemptions, that they had not been following the law or their own rules, and told them that they had to start actually doing that, which we think was great because that was undercutting our demand in the marketplace and really abusing a rule that was not intended for. So that was very good news. Uh, the second thing is that we had USMCA sign. President Trump signed that in January of 2020, uh, you know, 2020. And then, of course, uh, Canada became the last company to ratify that in March. And why is that a good deal? Well, because one of our largest destinations for exporting ethanol is to Canada. And so having that free trade agreement, uh, USMCA being signed, meant that we'd have that continuity of that those agreements going forward so that we would not see a disruption in that marketplace and would allow us to continue to um, export our ethanol to Canada. So that was very good news. And of course, one of the things we continue to see is that uh, ethanol uh, pumps in Nebraska were continuing to be uh, uh, installed. Uh, we had 100, uh, since 2017, we'd have, uh, we've had 114 flex fuel pumps and 97 E15 pumps being installed. And that uh, was oftentimes a, a partnership, public-private partnership. So with grants from the Corn Board, or uh, when we're talking about the biofuel um, infrastructure partnership or the high blends infrastructure incentive program, uh, all those different programs were able to help us get some of these pumps installed. And uh, you know, previously the EPA had ruled that we could use E15 all year round. So we were looking with a lot of momentum coming into 2020. And then, well, in fact, in February, 2020, we had a very, it was a, a great month for ethanol exports. And then of course we had the pandemic hit and that has impacted not just the ethanol industry, but every industry in this country. Uh, it's been a very tough year for every American and indeed everybody around the world as we've had to react to this pandemic. Uh, you know, for example, we saw demand for gasoline drop in 2020 by over 13% and correspondingly ethanol being burning cars to the same over 13% uh, drop. But we also saw the grit and determination and resilience of our ethanol plants. You know, we've, we're the, still the number one producer or number two producer of ethanol in the country with 25 plants and 2.6 billion um, gallons of capacity. And many of our plants switched to be able to provide hand sanitizer at a time that was very, very short. And so great partnerships were developed to be able to distribute that hand sanitizer to our healthcare facilities, to our communities, uh, to anybody who needed to have those. 
Um, I know there was a great partnership with the University of Nebraska, for example. So that was a great example of how our industry responded to making sure that we could meet the needs of the pandemic and really demonstrating that innovation. And so uh, one of the other impacts, of course, of the pandemic was that we uh, saw a, a decrease in our export markets as well. So uh, again, just it's been a really challenging time for the industry here. But as Pam was saying earlier, as we work our way through this pandemic, the future looks very bright. You know, for example, uh, January 2021 was uh, the second best export uh, month that we've had in the last two years for ethanol. In fact, the only month that was better in the last two years uh, was that February 2020 that we had. So that's encouraging that we see that. In fact, that was that January 21 export was up about 48% over where we were in December. So we want to continue to focus on markets to be able to export ethanol because that's going to accomplish the same things overseas and other uh, markets that it does here, which is, you know, save consumers at the pump, help clean up the market. And of course, it's still good for our farmers and ranchers here in Nebraska. So we want to continue to focus on that. Now, obviously, that's one of the things as governor we've not been able to do during the pandemic is get out there and promote ethanol. Uh, you may recall from uh, if you've seen some of my previous talks, the, the three pillars I have prone agriculture include, uh, you know, making sure that we're uh, focusing on value added agriculture. And of course, ethanol is one of our bigger value added agricultural products that we have here in the state. And so we want to continue to look for ways to be able to export that and create demand for that. Uh, we also um, were uh, talking about how we need to continue to focus on opening up uh, international markets. And obviously, we've not been able to do that. We've not been able to travel to be able to do that. But hopefully, as we get through this pandemic, we'll be able to start that up again. And then, of course, property tax relief. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute when I talk about some of the legislative priorities. But uh, it was great to see the um, all the folks uh, that pitched in to help uh, create that hand sanitizer. They created, you know, uh, actually created 200,000 gallons of hand sanitizer at a time in our state when we're through. So as we look into 2021, where do we go from here? Well, it gets back into continuing to focus on value-added agriculture, expanding those markets, and property tax relief. Uh, I expect that uh, we're going to have some opportunities, if not the latter half of this year, certainly next year, to get back on the road to be able to talk about how we can promote uh, our products here in Nebraska. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, meetings already with embassy staff uh, in different countries. For example, just last week, we had a uh, a teleconference or a video call with the Malaysian embassy to talk about the opportunities there. We've been looking at uh, opportunities in Indonesia. I'll be getting on another call here uh, early next month with our Mexican embassy to talk about the conditions there. So there's uh, really the opportunity to be able to recultivate these relationships with regard to international trade and get back in those markets so that we can be seen and promoting our products there. So that's going to be very important. Uh, the other thing that, uh, you, that we have is the current legislative session, which is uh, one where, you know, again, we've got a number of key priorities that are coming out in this. Uh, I proposed a budget that continues to have, uh, you know, be fiscally conservative. We proposed only growing the budget at one and a half percent over the in each year of the next two years. And while doing that, uh, add significantly to our property tax relief. One of the things we did last year was pass LB 1107, which makes a significant contribution to property tax relief here in the state. Now, one of the things I had done previously is we'd had a property tax credit relief fund that was $140 million, and we've taken it up now to $275 million, so nearly doubled that. But in to on top of putting that uh, $275 million in statute, which makes it much more difficult to change, we also passed the ability to do a refundable income tax credit. And what that means is uh, based upon the school property taxes you pay, the state of Nebraska is gonna issue you a refund check, even if you don't pay taxes. So it's a credit against your taxes, but if you don't owe any taxes, we'll actually send you a check. So that's what it means by, by having that refundable income tax credit. And that is going to help us significantly increase the amount of property tax relief. Last year, when we passed the bill, it would amount to about $125 million. But if you look at where our revenues are growing, and here in Nebraska, our revenues continue to be strong and, and significantly beat our forecast. In fact, 
when the forecasting board met in February, they took our three-year forecast up by $462 million. Well, why is that important? Because it means that a lot of those uh, surplus revenues then go into property tax relief through LB 1107. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that we'll be providing, uh, we have the opportunity to provide uh, over $1.4 billion in property tax relief in this upcoming biennium. So that's really, really exciting news for the property taxpayers in Nebraska. And of course, as you know, our farmers and ranchers are some of the largest property taxpayers. So they're gonna uh, benefit significantly from that, that legislation. And uh, so I'm excited to work with the legislature to make sure that we're delivering the maximum amount of property tax relief possible under that bill to be able to make sure we're providing that relief. In addition, we've got a bill from Senator Breezy, LB 408, which would limit how fast property taxes go up to 3% a year. Now, the, if you look over the last 10 years, property taxes by local governments have gone up an average of 4.3%. You might say, well, 4.3% doesn't sound too bad, except if you compound that year after year after year for 10 years, that amounts to uh, almost a 52% overall increase in your property taxes. And at the same time, incomes in Nebraska have grown up 48% over those 10 years and inflation only 18.7%. Well, what does that mean? That means that property taxes are growing faster than inflation or, inflation or people's incomes, and that's what's making people mad. So if we had put a 3% cap in 10 years ago, we would have limited that increase to about 34%, even at the maximum 3% rate, and would have allowed incomes to grow faster than property taxes. So that's an important aspect of this bill. Another really important initiative that we've got is broadband. Uh, we are working to provide an additional $20 million in uh, broadband infrastructure over the course of the next two years to help connect about 80,000 Nebraska households that do not have 25 megabit download and three megabit upload speeds. That's important because we've seen what's happened with uh, this pandemic. When you're on the wrong side of the digital divide, uh, makes working from home or remote education very, very difficult. And on top of those, you can think about things like telehealth, uh, entertainment or e-commerce that are also difficult. Now we use some of our CARES Act money to um, invest about $29 million to connect about 17,600 Nebraskans to that broadband access. And this additional $40 million over the next two years will help connect an additional 30,000. But you can see we're still a long ways from getting all 80,000 folks who don't even have that basic infrastructure. And, and then you can think about this, this is much like rural electrification or rural telephone. Uh, the state needs to step in to be able to help make sure that we get every resident that opportunity to participate in the digital, aid, digital age and make sure that we can do the things like work from home and have remote education. So that's going to be a big initiative for us as well. And I'm working with Senator Friesen, who's the chair of the Transportation and Telecommunication Committee, as well as a speaker who has prioritized the bill. We also have veterans tax relief that is on the table uh, with regard to this uh, legislature. Last year, we got half of it done. And this year we're coming back for the other half of it. This is important because we wanna make sure we're retaining our veterans in the state. When companies talk about workforce development, this is a workforce that is already developed. Certainly in my career at Ameritrade, we took advantage of the experience veterans had to hire them. They quickly moved up into management positions. Same thing here at the state of Nebraska, we hired veterans to fill very important roles like the Director of Economic Development, uh, our Chief Human Resources Officer, and of course, the gentleman who runs our Department of Veterans Affairs. So we wanna get good veterans to stay here because we know what a great contribution they make after they get out of the military. And if you look at states like uh, Iowa or South Dakota, they are growing their veterans population at two to three times the rate of their normal population growth. While here in Nebraska, we grow our veterans population at half our normal population's growth. Uh, we're at a competitive disadvantage to five of the six states, so this is an important initiative to get passed, and it did get through the first round of reading. In addition to uh, those initiatives, we also have more on education, fully funding the state aid formula, adding money into our textbook loan program, supporting um, uh, opportunity scholarships, and then uh, adding private colleges to the list that would be um, eligible to get those career scholarships that we passed last year as well. So expanding the amount of folks and the dollars that would be available for those scholarships for our young Nebraskans to be able to get that education they need here in the state to be our future leaders. And then finally, one of the things that we have to focus on is also we have to replace our Nebraska State Penitentiary. 
It's nearing the end of its useful lifetime, and we need to get started on that project to protect the public safety. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what we have going on with regard to our legislative proposals. And then finally, I just thought I'd just kind of wrap up a little bit with where we are in the pandemic before we get into questions and answers. Uh, you know, obviously, we, this country has not fought a pandemic in over a century. And again, we talked about how the ethanol industry has been innovative to be able to help meet the needs of the folks that we have here in Nebraska. Uh, we put together a seven pillar plan or seven lines of effort to be able to combat the pandemic. It included uh, testing. So the state of Nebraska went out and contracted with a firm to uh, help us do our testing at one point had more than double that helped us more than double the amount of testing we were able to do in the state. Contact tracing to support local public health departments who are the frontline contact tracers, but we hired at one point over 1500 to be able to make sure we were calling people to let them know that if they've tested positive, they need to stay home and isolate. If they've been exposed, they need to quarantine. Uh, and that's really the blocking and tackling of how you handle a pandemic is that con uh, testing and contact tracing. We also bought personal protective equipment, over $50 million worth from the state to distribute to our healthcare providers, first responders, and so forth, to make sure they were appropriately protected from uh, the spread of the pandemic. We set up uh, the Nebraska Accommodation Project to allow Nebraskans to be able to uh, get a hotel room or a dorm room if they didn't feel uh, safe uh, going home, whether they didn't want to pick up the virus at home or bring the virus back at home. And we had about 500 Nebraskans take advantage of that. Uh, we also had plans around specific uh, groups that were at more risk. I think, uh, you know, congregate care or congregate living like uh, nursing homes and so forth, or work settings that are very difficult, like food processing plants, or even our corrections department, uh, where we've got a lot of people living in close quarters to get each other. So uh, we had special plans for all those to help limit the spread of the virus. And then finally, we had our directed health measures. Um, and some of the preventative things we've done to, you know, limit things such as how many people could be in the restaurants and so forth. And then finally, our last line of effort is around the vaccines. And Nebraska continues to stack up very well. Uh, we're generally close to the top 10, if not in the top 10, uh, with regard to the number of people um, per 100,000 that's been vaccinated, um, or just in general, with our use of the vaccines, uh, how many total people have been vaccinated. We're uh, actually in the top uh, one, two, or three of the number of seniors, you know, people 65 years or older that have been vaccinated. And that because of our focus on trying to get to that most vulnerable group, 83% uh, of our deaths have occurred in folks who are 65 years and older. So by focusing on that group, we think we're really helping to reduce the number of fatalities we have here in our state. We're the 15th best state for testing. Um, and then uh, just in general, you can see the results as we've kept our mortality rates down. Uh, our cases, uh, our case counts are going down, our hospitalizations are down to really a level they were um, back in the summer when we almost reached our, our lowest. I think we're at 107 hospitalizations as of today. Uh, I think the lowest after we hit, after this pandemic hit us, uh, we fell down to 95. So you can see we're really uh, seeing those hospitalizations go down to a, a low level. We wanna to continue to drive that level down. And again, one of the ways to do that is through vaccines. Um, so we're working to get those vaccines out as quickly as possible to be able to help us get through this pandemic and get done. So that was a lot to cover in a very short period of time. I'd encourage all of you, if you have not signed up to get your vaccine, please do so. You can sign up uh, in Lincoln uh, or Omaha on the Lancaster or Douglas County websites. You can go to the state website um, to sign up there. That's vaccinate.ne.gov. Uh, if you know folks who want to sign up but don't have access to a computer, you can have them call our, our toll-free number. Uh, that, that way, 833-998-2275 uh, is a way to get signed up. So there's a variety of ways to be able to do that. And we encourage everybody to get vaccinated because ultimately this is how we get through the pandemic when enough people have the antibodies that we can't, the virus doesn't spread any further. And uh, we are to the point now that we're vaccinating that group in age 50 to 64. So we've got through kind of the 65 year olds and plus, and we want more people to sign up and get registered and get the vaccine. So. Like I said, that was a lot to cover in a very short period of time. Uh, maybe we could just, uh, Jan, if you could, moderate some of the questions and answers. Yes, and, and thank you again, Governor Ricketts. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, without the support of you and your office, uh, that 200,000 gallons of hand sanitizer could have never been done. We, we could have never done it. You know, that went to the USDA. It went all over the state of Nebraska. did some wonderful things with that, that work. So thank you again personally for that. Um, <clears throat> okay, from Todd Neely. Todd asks, 
a lot of states are moving towards low carbon fuel standards to benefit state ethanol producers. Can you foresee this happening in Nebraska? And what would that look like? Yeah, so uh, there wasn't any bill legislation uh, introduced on that this year. I think what we want to do is continue to work with the Biden administration on this. Uh, unfortunately, as you all know, the Obama administration never really got into this. And yet we know that our product helps clean up the air. Uh, you know, actually, U.S. News and World Report just came out and we Nebraska got one of our highest rankings ever. Uh, well, actually, it was the highest ranking we've ever got in the best states ranking. We ended up number six. And that's in part because we got ranked very highly on our natural resources and how clean our air and land and water is. So I think we want to continue to focus um, working with the EPA on getting um, ethanol out there more often, uh, working to be able to get uh, you know the infrastructure out there, continue to make sure they're not granting too many of the small refinery exemptions. Uh, I've commented on that in the past with the EPA about how important ethanol is to cleaning up the environment, how important it is to our farmers and ranchers here in the state. So uh, I would say that since we don't have any current legislation on that, at least for the upcoming year, we ought to be continuing to focus on how we can work with the EPA to drive that message. And I think with the E15 all year round, we've got a great marketing opportunity there. Uh, oh, one of the things I forgot to mention, uh, which was a very uh, important deal, is we just wrapped up uh, last fall and just announced uh, a few weeks ago the results of our E30 study, where we had uh, put 50 state vehicles on E30. So these are conventional vehicles, not flex fuel, but conventional vehicles. And instead of running E15, we ran E30. And we uh, worked with the University of Nebraska Department of Engineering to keep track of mileage and maintenance and so forth. And really were able to demonstrate that some of the misinformation out there that, the, that has been put out there with regard to the harm that you know ethanol can maybe cause to engines is just simply not true. That uh, we saw no degradation in, in um, maintenance. Uh, we had no problems with it. And that at E30 with about a 2% discount to E15, would be uh, more cost effective for consumers. So it was a great study out there. I know other states uh, want to uh, do that as well. So um, we want to continue to focus on things like that to be able to, to drive that message out there about the importance of using E30. Well, I, after, well, I also heard Roger might be filling up with his car with E30 all the time, which of course be. is not technically legal, I don't think. I do it. I hope they don't come and arrest me. Um, right, you shouldn't pass a law you can't enforce, right? <laughs> Governor, I was Ricky afraid Morris. you were going to bring that up today. Thank you for bringing that up, though. <laughs> Christy Moore asks, uh, you know, how can we get more of your fellow governors and colleagues uh, to uh, see and realize the benefits of uh, continuing liquid fuels, especially low carbon fuels like ethanol? Um, yeah. So I think uh, one of the things is we have to, you know, it just takes outreach from constituents in their states. So I think to the extent that we can get people who are pro-ethanol within the various states to be able to reach out and talk to their governors, that's going to be helpful. And, and you know, here's the other thing. We've got actually a common interest here uh, with uh, the petroleum industry in promoting liquid fuels. Now, the Biden administration thinks they're going to be able to get to electric vehicles, but we all know that technology is still pretty far from major adoption. So we've got a solution right now how to help them clean up the environment. And so I think that's one of the things that we can work on with other um, states, especially maybe even oil producing states, is to talk about, hey, we should be focusing on liquid fuels. We've got that in common. We don't have a lot of things sometimes to talk about in common, but this is one of them. And so uh, promoting liquid fuels and specifically talking about ethanol and how it cleans up the air is one of the things, again, working with the Biden administration. I think we've got an opportunity if they truly want to focus on how we can make sure we clean up the environment. Uh, Steve Vandergren asks, how can we collectively push back against the EPA um, from using flawed studies and flawed test methods um, for ethanol? Yeah, it's just going to be constant pressure, constant pressure from our federal delegations, uh, constant pressure from our governors. That's one of the things that, you know, when I've written letters or done testimony, we talk about the flawed science they're using, how it's old, outdated, whatever. And it's just going to be a, you know, you just got to, we just got to constantly be providing them. And that's, you know, frankly, one of the reasons why we want to do this E30 study is to really combat some of the misinformation out there and, and provide the EPA with information about, hey, you can do higher blends of uh, ethanol in conventional vehicles and it's going to be fine. So I think we got to continue to do more research like that. So states doing more of that as well will also help us get our message across. But it's just going to be a slog. You know, we just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing, uh, you know, be that, that squeaky wheel. And another question from Todd Neely. Um, 
is Nebraska exploring the possibilities of an LCFS in the near future? I'm sorry, LCFF? Oh, low, low, low I have not seen any centers that have uh, brought that up yet. So I, I don't know the answer. It doesn't mean somebody's not doing it, but I, I haven't seen any legislation on that. Hey, Jan, I'm sorry. I just realized I got to get going because I got another call to get to. So thank you very much for your time today, Governor. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And thank you all for continuing to promote ethanol, which is a huge industry for our state of Nebraska.